Hello, my friend, and welcome to the 249th and a half episode of the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. If you listened, uh, I don't know, a couple of episodes ago, I'd mentioned how I'm bringing on a new team, the VA staffer folks, thesaleswhisperer.com slash VA staffer, get you a little bonus there. Uh, and as I've been working with them on these processes to streamline the production of both the Sales Podcast and uh, the CRM Sushi Podcast, um, we've been actually working ahead, which is a good thing, unless you're kind of chaotic and spontaneous like I am, like my good friend Kat Leterzo was on episode 248 and a half. Uh, I loved her story. Go back and check it out. She's built multiple six and seven figure businesses being chaotic and spontaneous, and she admits her staff of 10 just cleans up behind her. But anyway, as we have started working ahead, um, I've had some great guests. Kat, uh, today we've got Colby K. Uh, we've got Derek Halpern coming up. We've got Tony Lucero coming up. So I'm just creating half episodes, if you will, so my team doesn't have to go redo the artwork and everything else. Because, hey, does it really matter what the artwork says as long as there's good content? And that's what I am striving to bring you all the time. I'm reaching out to some uh, great people, some bigger names, uh, a little bigger reach, get some different insight uh, to help you grow your sales and stand out. Uh, you're in for a treat today with Colby K. Uh, this dude is just over the top uh, in a good way. Uh, and he's very honest, very transparent about his struggles. Um, and then how he turned that around, you know, the old adage of... Uh, um, what make your misery your ministry, which is something he kind of did. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm reading uh, a book by Dan Kennedy and, uh, Chip Kessler called make them believe. And I'm rereading it. This came out in 2010. Uh, and it's interesting how different things stand out at different times. Even though I read this book, I, I underlined it. I took notes, different things are standing out, but this is a book about a guy back in the early 1900s, J. R. or John R. Brinkley gave himself the name doctor. Then he went and bought the title. So he was quote unquote legitimate, but he really wasn't a doctor. He actually, he started to go to law school or, or uh, medical school and he just, he was a shortcut taker. But this guy back before the internet, back before television, back before anything fancy, he had radio uh, and he had direct mail. Um, but he convinced men that he could transplant goat testicles to cure erectile dysfunction. And the dude made millions. Uh, he started advertising on the radio. Then he bought the radio station. Then he bought multiple radio stations. Then when the government cracked down, he moved. Uh, he was in Kansas. So he moved to the border of uh, Mexico, Del Rio, Texas. There's a, an Air Force uh, pilot training base there, and I've actually been there. And it is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so he moved to Del Rio, but then he had a radio tower on the Mexico side of the border and just a ton of wattage, ton of power. So he could still reach across the country um, and not be under U.S. guidelines because uh, his tower was in Mexico. So um, but, you know, people didn't want to just hear about medical issues and goat testicles. So he actually created talent. He either found the talent, found great talent, and he would bring them to Kansas to perform, or he'd find up-and-comers and help them become famous. So he, he created entertainment, which people wanted, and then he inserted his messaging in between the entertaining shows, right? Just like we have now. You have the commercials in between the stuff you want to see. Uh, but then the the commercials would resonate. You know, I've always said, you know, deliver a powerful message in a powerful manner. And this guy, Dr. Brinkley, delivered a powerful message in a powerful manner. And then people would think, well, okay, it was just for men. But you know what? There were a lot of wives who were dissatisfied at their husband's inability to perform. So even though it was the men that had to undergo the surgery, you know, in the book they talked about quite often it would be a wife responding first to the messaging, you know, asking for information and pushing or supporting her husband to make the trip, you know, by train, go see him. Uh, I mean, it was just a powerful 
story. I'm, you know, I'm about halfway through my second reading of it. You know, but the point is, and the way this ties into Colby, you know, Colby is a great, powerful, over-the-top marketer. John R. Brinkley was a great, powerful, over-the-top marketer. I, admittedly, have not been really good at being over the top. I'm, even though those of you who know me, we have a lot of fun. I goof off. I, I don't mind being the center of attention at an event or something, but I've never held myself out to be like this guru. Right? It's like I'm a dude, wakes up with messy hair and bad breath like everyone else, puts my pants on one leg at a time. Uh, but you do have to do a better job of putting yourself out there. Uh, and offering, you know, what Dan talks about in the book, offering the cure. And again, I've, uh, I readily admit, you know, there's no silver bullet. There's no guarantee. You know, you got to get up every day and hustle and get after it. Um, but we can still promote that as the cure, right? I have the cure for what ails you in sales. Now, the cure may be that I'll be by your side every step of the way supporting you. I've created an environment in the Make Every Sale community where you can get real-time support 24-7 from the community. I'm online, you know, most days, all day. If I see a pressing issue, I can hop on. Uh, we do live calls pretty much weekly, uh, over 41 videos recorded, you know. So, yeah, that is the cure. Now, the cure is not a pill, right? Take this, and 30 seconds later, you're a, a sales genius, it doesn't work that way, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting into practice what I'm reading, right? I'm testing the things on myself before I tell you to do it. Um, so, you know, rest assured the stuff you hear me say, it does work. Okay. And, uh, and I'll tell you when it's new, right. Or when I'm new in a particular journey and experimenting with something, but making yourself famous, you know, and he gives great examples, you know, Tony Robbins, he uses what he calls a carnival trick, that walking on fire. I mean, people have walked on fire. It's been documented going back into 1200 B.C. in India and even before then, okay? Um, Native Americans have done it. Uh, I mean, people all over the world have done it. And Tony Robbins, you know, surrounded himself with celebrities, and he became a celebrity, and he used simple little tricks, and he amped it up and made a name for himself, um, you know, there's so many people. Dr. Seuss, he was not a doctor. He was actually barred from writing for the school newspaper. I think he was at Columbia. And uh, I think he was critical of of the student body or critical of the administrators there. And so he was banned. And he was the editor of the school paper. So he changed his name to Dr. Seuss so he could write. And, you know, then he just lived up to it. Captain Kangaroo, he wasn't a captain. You know, give me a break. So you can literally, and people ask, what's the sales whisperer? And it's like, the sales whisperer is me. And I just made it up. And then I paid the government a thousand bucks and got a trademark for it. You know, so don't wait for somebody to anoint you the best. Anoint yourself as the best and then go out every day and prove it. Okay. And um, I think, I think you'll see it. Colby does a great job of that. If uh, you need help sustaining that and encouraging you to be over the top at least uh, be more visible, more of who you are, the best version of yourself, head on over to makeeverysale.com, would you? Join us there. Let's grow together. You get lifetime access, um, and you know, I'll be there to help you for as long as you're willing to seek assistance. So now let's bring on Colby K. Colby K. Let me read this here. Entrepreneur, author, speaker, lover, fighter. Husband, father, and revolutionary, all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome to the Sales Podcast, man. How the heck are you? My brother, it's good to be on the show. Thanks for having me on. So I noticed you're a fighter because, like, this is remote. But, you know, I'm coming to Phoenix in a couple of weeks, man. Are you... Are you going to change that? Uh, you going to change that status before I get there? No, no. I saw. You. I see your jujitsu shirt, man. We did our prep call. I told you, dude, I'm probably one of the only guys you know that can get themselves in there in, a, in an arm bar by themselves. Like I got myself, a, I got myself in a rear naked choke, like in the bathtub once. <laughs> You ever see a full metal jacket where he's like, choke yourself. He's uh -huh. like, not with uh -huh. your hand, with my hand. <laughs> That's so funny. He had to still choke me. Don't choke me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Very cool, man. So what are you up to, huh? For our listeners that may not know the craziness that is Colby K. Would you mind? Give us a little thumbnail sketch of uh, how you get into trouble, and then we'll dive down the rabbit hole. Yeah, man. It's uh, what I'm doing now, or frame it into perspective. It's, you know, I I grew up with two hardworking parents in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, Parents separated. I bounced around a lot. I got into entrepreneurship, starting a graphic design firm and a freelance kind of firm in uh, 2000s. Started working for the Olympics, left that, was in the music business for a long time, left the music business, got into corporate America, um, worked my way as an individual grunt behind a desk to be an executive, and there's all kinds of cool stories about about that we could dive into if you want, and became an executive running high-performance sales teams and marketing programs for you know some of the, the largest IT companies on the planet, did that. And left about four and a half years ago to start a software company. Went through the software company, um, it got sued after I left, and used that software. Started a sports agency, sold part of that, and then um, just started a consulting business. That's uh, like a technology consulting business. That that did really really well. We sold that uh, through part of a, a big acquisition. And I just had this knack where I had all my friends asking me, you know, how do you do what you do? How do you take these ideas and do stuff with them? It seems like you do them pretty fast. And I kind of put this knack into – I got this this nickname within some of my friends is the entrepreneur's entrepreneur, like being able to take an idea and actually take it to revenue you know, within a 30-day period using just basic business principles. And I've helped God. Right now I'm up to – it's close to, I would say, right around 500 entrepreneurs that have done, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue in the last four years. I've got a, uh, I'm a husband and a father. What else, man? I like long walks on the beach, uh, puppies, and uh, <laughs> naked hot yoga um, on my in my driveway. <laughs> Other than that, man, that's it. <laughs> That's why I send my drone ahead uh, to uh-huh. scope out your house to see if uh-huh. you're in the driveway or not before I drive by. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and then when I'm out there, you drive by. I know. I can. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I can neither confirm nor deny that statement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, craziness. So, uh, so very interesting. So you help people launch ideas. Is that a safe? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Now... Uh, do you help them determine if the idea is launchable first? Because, I mean, we have a lot of harebrained ideas. Yeah, so here are kind of the four steps with everything, right? These these principles, Wes, have been proven from Eve giving Adam the apple to Apple computers. You like that? Like what I'm doing there? That's kind, the of, key, kind of interesting. Right? I've said that a couple times. So I, I like it. It's, it. It kind of goes into four things, right? One is at the end of the day, entrepreneurs are, are problem solvers, right? So the, the first pillar that, that I go through is called the no, – it's that discovery phase. It's finding a group of people that have a, have a need or have a problem. Second piece is creating a product or a solution that actually solves that problem. The third piece is the validation. This is where many entrepreneurs kind of get it wrong. It's the validation process that whatever you've built – Whatever you've, you know, whatever that harebrained idea is, people say, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. I like it. It's being able to take it back into the marketplace and will people pay for it? Because just because you have a good idea and you think it's a good idea, the marketplace is the ultimate equalizer. Right. And then the, the last piece is, I, I call it the sell your face off. It's the, the selling and marketing aspects. You can take, if you're just one guy and have an idea and want to get out of your day job, I'm not the guy for you. If you're a mid-sized business and you know, let's say you're doing a million to two million, and you're trying to figure out how to scale to ten, and you want to hire and you want to, you know, you want to the, the scalability aspects of either enhancing what you currently have or adding more. You want to grow. That's where, where things do really well because what happens is the everybody has the idea, and if it's not a passionate idea, if it's just a money making idea, what happens is when things get hard because we always know it gets hard. That's where people fall off. And it becomes a hobby, right? It's uh, this stuff is not for the weak. I don't even recommend people do it. It's um, you know you're going to lose a lot. You're going to you're going to learn a lot, but you've got to have 
mental and emotional fortitude to make it. Right. So how do, so, all right. So you got these, these steps. Um, so do you have them create it before they validate it? No. So what we'll do, here's a great example is I was at teaching at ASU, uh, about three weeks ago, right? We we're teaching their finance class and we were, we were showing them essentially how to take ideas into revenue. And we said, okay, so what are the top, what are the things you hate as a student going, like going to school here? And everybody raised their hands and it was like, okay, the one big consensus was parking. Like <laughs> parking, parking was this huge issue, sure. right? We said, okay, so we got into Google Maps. We did all this in live in real time. So we got into Google Maps and we kind of did a, a quick swab of the area and the, you know, where people primarily parked. We found there were three lots of land that were going up that were just, that had been sitting there forever. There were a, a few old bars that had been torn down and it was literally like just gravel lots that were within a five minute walk. We found who the landowner was. From a leasing perspective, then we looked up a, a a company that would essentially do the asphalt. We did. We got email bids back all with, while we were doing this in class to do some general pricing exercises. Then we went back into the students and said, "Okay, so if we had the assuming we have the permits and legally we can, you know, we can get all this stuff done." The landowner said we could do it. We got the quote that says, "Here's how much it would cost to actually do the the pavement." Okay, we'd have to build, a, you know, kind of the cost of goods to build a shack and put some people in there to actually manage it, or would it be, you know, is it going to be, let's like, say, solar powered electronic meters? What does that look like? And we went through this whole entire process, and through the end of it, once we understood what the cost of goods were going to be and that it was a viable opportunity, it was then how much would you be willing to pay to park there? Right, and we have outliers. We have some people that are like, "Listen, I'd pay fifty bucks a month because it was about you know building it into a continuity, not a one-time fee." Right, and it was like, "Okay, I would pay ten dollars. I'd pay fifty dollars." So I say, "Well, what if we did it monthly?" Right, and if you paid for the year, you got it at a discount. You got it at a sixty percent discount, but we knew it was covering cost of goods. How many spaces did we have? And we went through that entire exercise in about two, three hours, and had a legitimate. A, leg- a legitimate, you know, outstanding the permits and some of the stuff that it takes from a construction perspective. But that's the kind of stuff you can go through within a matter of, you know, between three and four hours, you can go in and find a group of people with a problem, come up with something. It's it's in the validation process, Wes, where a lot of people get stuck. Right. Um, I'm not big on raising funds. I've raised over, God, I'm at sitting around $18.5 $18. million I've raised in the last four years, but I don't start raising money. Right. right. What I want to do is I want to I want to be able to find a group of people that have a problem big enough that I can solve that they're willing to pay for, and then I use the funding to scale. Right. So you know, there you get people into an early adopter or beta program through your validation process. That helps bankroll kind of the existence of the company, and you should be cast positive if you're doing it right. Right. And then then you go raise funds to scale. So yeah, we'll, we'll that that process. You can do that process over a you know a half day planning session. And yet, yeah, I, I'm not saying you can get people to buy it that fast, but you can go through and identify a group of people and come up with something for sure. Right. And yet people still do it backwards all the time. Uh, is it because they just don't know? I mean, are, are, are they stuck in 18 or 1960s model of business launching? You know, because you, you see people all the time that, that they'll go file a patent, right, and trademarks mm-hmm. and yep, yep. and get molds done in China and order, a, you know, a, a truck full of, I don't know, yoga mats. Uh, and mm-hmm. they're sitting in their, in their third car garage totally full for years and, and they go broke because they, they did it backwards. I think it's a, a couple things, man. We live in such a day and age where technology is the is – the, is probably the gateway, but again, the market's the equalizer. It's you know I use this example all the time. I had an apparel company in the '90s. It was like a kind of a street clothing brand around a time that Mark Echo was kind of doing his thing. It was it was right before Damon had done Fubu, but it was kind of an urban brand for uh, it was an urban brand. And uh, we had that company. We were doing about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, and it was like four of us. It's a lot of money for like four kids at the age of 20, you know, to, to be, be doing. And we ended up kind of folding the shop and selling out a big part of it because of the assets we carried. So you have to carry so much inventory at that time. How many people do you know that are like, I got a clothing idea. You hear this all the time. I got this clothing idea. I want to launch a clothing brand. It's great. 
and they're like, you know, they get their logo done or they do it themselves and, you know, Microsoft Word or something. And then they come back to you and they're like, hey, man, what do you think about my logo? And you're like, cool, man. Yeah. You're like in the back of your mind, you're like, it's really not that good. And people don't usually tell people the truth. So they're like, they pander. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm going to get some shirts done. Do you think you can get a shirt from me? Yeah, yeah, I'd get a shirt from you. And then that poor dude will go and buy, you know, spends four or $500 on shirts. And then the shirts get here. And then who buys the shirt? Nobody, dude. It's crickets. We live in a day and age now where everything can be done on demand, meaning I don't have to take the financial risk up front to carry inventory to build a, a clothing line. I can go to a company like Shopify and use Printful as a plug-in. I'm not going to make $20 a shirt. I only might make $7 a shirt, but they'll print them as people order them, and then as I get enough orders coming in, I can make a decision on if I want to carry inventory. So it's, it's just you know that's one aspect, but the other stuff that you talked about, dude, that that I cover all the time is when to file an LLC, when to file the patents, like all that kind of stuff. It's like, dude, you don't even know if there's anybody's going to buy your shit yet. Like, why would you go? If I had $600 to spend on something, I'm, I'm trying to prove the concept or I'm putting it in marketing to get people to buy my stuff. I'm not filing all the paperwork, right? right? It's I, once people start in, I, I think it's a couple things. I think people are very secretive. On what they do, and they really think that people give a shit, and they're going to go steal it. So I, I think that makes people do things a little bit different. Like you got to get an LLC, and then you get the purpose of getting an LLC is to go get an EIN number, which is how you set your bank account up and separate your finances. So it's one of those things where I, I'm big on the LLC once you start to make money. You know, if you're making a couple grand, go down, get yourself the LLC is quick. You can do them on legal Zoom in Arizona. We, mine cost me like literally 180 bucks. I had it the next like two days. Right. It was super cheap. So you can do it. You're, there's local sites. You can do it pretty quick if you've got your stuff together. But wait until you start to make a little bit of money to see if you know, if the market is even ready for whatever it is you're bringing to market. Right. Yeah, and it, everybody just does it backwards. Oh, well. Why, why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I, think I, I agree with what you said about people being secretive. Uh, I see this all the time. It, Somebody will reach out to me about helping consulting, and they want me to sign an NDA. <laughs> and like, I don't know, eight times out of ten, I'll just say, no, we're probably not a fit. <laughs> you know, it's like if you want to start out that way, it's like, do you really think your idea is so good that I'm going to stop everything I've built over the last 12 years and mm -hmm. just go launch that idea? No, you know? I'm going to run like, down and take your idea. <laughs> yeah, and even yeah. if I do, okay, let's say I sign that NDA, and then I go steal your idea. Do you have the means and the drive to chase me and sue me? Yeah, you know, I've I've been in multiple lawsuits. I've won them all. Yeah, uh, and only because I'm just stubborn. Yeah. you know. Now I'm like, whatever, take it, take the money, just yeah. be gone. You yeah. know, the hassle yeah. just isn't worth. It. I've learned the hard way. Uh, so yeah, so people start out that way and, and I don't know, I, I think they feel like it's like salespeople with a, with a BS pipeline. They know those deals aren't real, but they keep That's them right. on the books so they can That's tell right. their boss that they got a full pipeline because they don't want to do the hard work of prospecting. Prospecting. Yep. yep. Right. And Pick so the, the entrepreneur, if they can say, well, I've, I've got paperwork filed and the attorney's looking at it and I've got this great Graphic design company, which is like a 10-week process. We're going, going through iterations on the logo. And so yeah, they, yeah. Can, they can lie to themselves. Feel like they're doing something. That they're doing something, right? And Because they know as soon as they ask for a sale and the money doesn't come in, then they know it's all BS. Yeah. And then they've got to go back to the drawing boards and try to launch something that's real. So I, I think that's why they put it off. There's a great quote, a CEO, his name is Ken Lamnick. I used to work for at a company called Insight, and he, he used to tell us all the time, the sales guys, don't don't confuse activity for accomplishment. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, we can all find stuff to do. <laughs> if yeah, we, we, results, it doesn't matter. We're all majoring in the minors. Uh-huh. That is true. That is true. So – do people come to you when they recognize that and they want help launching or are you great at like knocking the cobwebs loose and saying, no, my friend, turn 180 degrees. Now I'm going to help you. Uh, both. I think both. It's, and, and let me be clear too, because I, I'm not a coach in the sense of coaching. It's when well, you've spent 20 years in business, you learn a lot of things, you, you, you lose a lot of things and, 
you know, I grew up with a mattress on the floor. And like, I remember, you know, specific times where I had to choose between getting gas or groceries or, um, you know, getting diapers or getting lunch for the week. Um, at the end of a pay cycle, just like struggling. I mean, there, there was a time growing up, I was, how old was I? 20, 21, 22, uh, maybe 19 actually. So I think it was right before I was 20. There was a, this is before gas stations used to do the prepay. Right. And you, you could just go up and, and pump. And I remember, dude, there was a one by my house, man. And once a month, I'd pump, find myself in a scenario where I I did a gas and go once and was like came back around like three weeks later and like paid twice for it. But it was like, you know, having to make the decision on like the, the fundamentals of just living and like keeping your power on. And, you know, I remember a time, dude, when I was first starting out where they had, in Arizona, they had prepaid power which is, I know it's a, f- a funny thought, but it was a box that would be in your house that would control your power. And you had a card and you had to put money on that card to keep power on. Right. And like, you, you'd come up to the end of a month, man. And it was like, dude, what do I, do I buy a gallon of milk or gas, put gas in my car? Or do I go down to the grocery store and put $10 on the power card? Right. So I, I like my beginnings are, that's where I started. And it took me, you know, 15 years to get to a point where I was making, you know, six figures plus comfortably, you know, I was more out work. It's not that I'm smarter than anybody. It was just I outworked everybody. And I was humble knowing I didn't know anything. I didn't know enough. And I continually was a student learning from those that were better than me. And I do that today. And I, I put all that on the line to leave to go start a business. And now I had, at this point, I had three kids just before my youngest was born. So I had three kids and put it all on the line and just left. I mean, it was a calculated risk. I didn't just quit. But I mean, I took six months to ex- exit the business and I was building my business. So we had about 250K in revenue when I left about before I got sued. It was one of those things where you learn just that, just quick, you know, two minute synopsis. You learn a lot there. Right. And people came to me, it came out of fruition. It wasn't something I wanted to go do. And it's not my core business. I mean, I've got. Um, a handful of other things I, that keep me really, really busy. Busy. I've got a health and wellness program focused on stress management, um, and then I have a, another online education program that I've built with a, a buddy of mine, and then the, the kids. So you know, the consulting thing is something that came out of necessity, where people are like, "How do you continue to do this? Like, it seems like you're launching new products and new services like every quarter. Like, how do you do that? How are you so fast at it?" So that's where I started to share, you know, the old days of people in corporate America saying, "How do I get out of this trap?" I do. I'm a firm believer of the working 60 hours at a desk for somebody else at the same company for 18 years. Like that's not the game plan, right? Right. When you look at the average American makes thirty seven thousand dollars, thirty nine thousand, thirty nine five a year. When you take out insurance and you take out uh, federal taxes, state taxes, that that person brings home about a seventeen hundred dollar check a month. By the day, it ends up being like thirty six dollars a day, thirty seven fifty a day. Is how much seventy percent of Americans live on. The average American has less than ten thousand dollars in savings when they retire. Four hundred one ks were never a long term strategy. Companies don't do matches hardly, and you you put all this work and all this time in for this you know quote unquote golden years, and then you get out, you're sick and you're you're broke, and then you die. That that to me is not the. I mean, I saw both my parents go through it. That's when I left. I left to go do my own thing. I firmly believe that like, the, the system is not built for us, dude. And nobody's. I mean, nobody talks about it. You know, we've got to go build our way off the. Gr- I call it unplugging from the matrix. Right. right. That's why I'm as passionate about it as I am. Is helping as many people as I can understand that you can make supplemental income. I don't want you to quit your job, but I w- wouldn't it be great if you could make an extra two, three thousand dollars a month? Right. Right. I mean, to some people, that's life changing, dude. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think they say that uh, the average bankruptcy is because like somebody like they can't make up seven hundred eighty five dollars a month or something like that. Yep. uh, Or average foreclosure. I think it's bankruptcy. So the average American debt, dude, is one hundred thirty thousand dollars a household. The average American finance, like how much I make is like 40 grand. I make 40. The average debt is 130. We're continually put in a debt cycle, dude. Like it's that's the way the system around us is built. The middle class is meant to be stuck where it's at, and the upper class continues to gri- to raise. And until you can figure out what the one percent does, you're going to be stuck getting lower and lower and lower and devalued to the point where you're sick, dead, and broke. And I refuse. If that's what happens to me in the end, Wes, I'll tell you what, dude. Like th- this is the fighter. Is I won't go down without a fight. Yep. And I won't go down not knowing that I've done everything I absolutely can to pull myself through it. Yep. 
right? I refuse to have my future in the hands of somebody else at the end of the day. Yep. Because nobody gives a shit about us, dude, but us, right? Yep. <laughs> as selfish as that might sound, it's like your family and your close relatives do, but – Outside of that, nobody gives a shit about your well-being. Your boss doesn't. Your fan, like your people you work with, don't. You're you're a uh, you're a cog in a wheel, man. Yeah. I mean, how many of your listeners have have been let go? Yeah. Like I have. I've been let go four or five times. I can tell you, I know how that feels, especially when you feel like you're indispensable because you're like a high producer and you get let go because you have kind of that ego of like, nah, <laughs> not me. Like, how does that feel? Mm-hmm. You know, do you, you think the company didn't like you left on a Friday? You think they didn't open the doors on Monday? Hell yeah, they did. I know founders of companies that split and they still had business come on Monday. So yeah. you know, you're not indispensable, man. So when you look at it like that and there's, you know, don't be biding your time. Like we've got to go out there and proactively build because that legacy doesn't happen without us, you know? Yeah. I know. Hell, I, I was let go and I was over quota. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a humbling uh, experience, man. <laughs> I know. It, right, it's so, like it's like dating, right? Like, how did you feel? It's like a bad breakup. You're like, like you know, the girl you thought you had a good relationship with that just won't call you back. You're like, what happened? Like, you just never know. It's like one of those, man. Like, uh, you tell you superficial shit on the outside, and then you're like, why? Why won't she call me back? <laughs> I know. It's. Uh, I remember one time. Um, golly, it was it was President's Day, two thousand four. My wife and I were in a new house, and um, golly, how many NAMI babies we had then? We had three, four. We had four. And we were wondering if she was pregnant. And uh, I get a call. So we were off that day, and I get a call from my boss. And I'm like, well, that's not good. And she was setting up a little picnic on the front yard. And uh, so it was right around noontime. Because we were wondering, I knew things were tough at the company. We were in, in technology and, and just yep. constant reorgs and layoffs. And uh, and we always had a joke that every time she was pregnant, we either moved houses, moved cities, moved jobs, or all three. You know, So all the most stressful things you can have in your life yes. other than the death yes. of the family, right? We'd, yeah. we, we would do all of that. And so, and so I got off the phone, and she was set up outside, and kids are there. And I walk out, and I said... And I said, you're pregnant. And she said, you got laid off. I mean, we just, <laughs> yeah, no. we just had, that was the code word, right? All uh-huh. this stuff had to happen and wasn't my fault. It was just, I was the, the junior person and I was over quota. Didn't matter. You know, mm-hmm. bye-bye. So you got to roll with it, right? You got to keep, kids still want to eat. Got to pay the bills. Mortgage life, hap- life still happens, man. You know, oh, woe is me. But 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 I have all these degrees and uh, uh, then they don't care. Let me ask you this, man. Have you – so in that scenario, how long did you spend dwelling and then how long did you spend like growing to go out and get something else? Yeah, and, and that's just it. Like I, my story is always you – know, I tell people I, I didn't have the luxury of – uh, sleeping in my buddy's basement for six months while I found myself. You know, yeah. when I got out of the Air Force, I was 27 years old, had a wife, a baby, another kid on the way. It was like, hey, figure this out, right? I got to drive down the road, keep up with traffic, you know, put on autopilot, steer with my foot while I reach in under the wheel well, you know, and change the freaking spark plug because yeah. I couldn't stop, you know? So we we knew it'd be all right. And, you know, it they were, I'd been there for a while, so they were cool with, um, I actually, on that one job at least, most of them just were cut. But uh, they kept me on board for like six weeks to mm-hmm. work through a trade show that was coming up in, in my backyard. And um, and then a decent severance. But uh, before the severance was even up, the former president of that company was the, became the CEO of a company there in Austin. And uh, he moved from like Connecticut and to Austin Heard I was laid off, hired me before my severance was up. Yeah. Uh, for more I, money. I, I just remember, it's, it's a blessing. I remember my first real heart, like my first corporate heartbreak where I thought I was indispensable and I had done all these things. I was the young hotshot and I let my ego get in the way. And I remember we had played a Thanksgiving football game for the company and I caught a ball and um, I tore my labrum. And I remember I went home. I was real sick. Long and short, I got surgery. And I was home recovering after surgery. I was still like had just come out of anesthesia. It was the same day. And HR called me and said, we're downsizing part of your division. And they like had a script and things. They wanted me to read to these people, like this lineup of people. And I was like, I'd hired all those people personally. 
went through and did my thing. And like, there's people I knew their families, like we did barbecues together. It's like, I I went through this, this list of people and then it's like six o'clock at night. And and it's like been an hour since I'd been on the phone and I get the call and it was HR. They were letting me go. And I was like, you son of a bitch. Like that was such a weaselly thing to do. Like, why would you just do that first? And then you manage these people. Like, why would you do that to me? Oh yeah. And then, uh, dude, I I, I spent two weeks, dude, I spent two weeks in the woe was me. Like I'm going to sue them. And like, Oh my God, like how dare them. And I tore my arm out because of them. And And then I I looked around, I looked around and was like, shit, I just lost two weeks of time. I could be out there getting a job. Like, what am I doing? And that was the only time I ever, ever felt sorry for myself in that scenario. Yeah. Cause like the more time you say, woe was me is the less time you spend building. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, I, I mean, I was punched in the gut a couple of times. I, my very first job, I was a stockbroker and, um, I mean, I left the air force to go work for this company. And, uh, after I was there six months, even though I already had my own licensing before I arrived, um, they said, Oh yeah, you owe us three years or $36,000 for the additional licenses we helped you get. Mm. And I was like, I'm not signing that. And they said, sign it or turn in your key. I was like, well, here's my, here's key. my key. Yeah, see you yeah. later. But uh, I couldn't get a job after that. I was I was unemployable uh, because trying to explain how after just six months, you know, and then this a lawsuit with your boss. And so <laughs> that's a whole other story, though. I've uh, been brother. there. Yeah, yeah. When you get here, we'll talk about it. When you come to Phoenix, well, I'll come see you. We'll talk about it. <laughs> we'll just cry in our beers. Oh, that's no. it. That's it. We'll hug each other. Jiu-jitsu. <laughs> Give a little throat <laughs> massage. That's it. <laughs> little Not Ezekiel. my hands, your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So how how do you learn while you earn? Because you were talking about that. You were you were learning, uh, applying, still going. Because I see a lot of people. They're like professional students. I see them at every conference, uh, and I'm like, have you take have you applied anything you learned from the last conference? You know, how do you, how do you keep from majoring in the minors, um, uh, so you can stay profitable? You can get tired of being broke. I think like you can't <laughs> only, I mean, you're only going to learn so much about, I mean, you gotta, you gotta take action, dude. You should be learning every day, but I, I, I see the same thing. I see career students, right? Like people that literally just, they go to, if they buy every course, they buy every book, like you said, they're at every trade show, every, you know, mastermind. So I don't even think they work, and then it, it's. I think it's the fear to take the steps. It's like I'm not ready. I got to keep learning or listening to every you know every Gary V podcast or every <laughs> every every Grant Cardone you know YouTube. It's like you, you got to just stop and know that there are basic fundamentals, and you'll see a systematic kind of platform or baseline that everybody teaches. Take that and go. You should be continually evolving. You shouldn't stop learning, but. Uh, I, I think you just have to do it. And some people, if if that's you, you're probably not meant to do this. Like go go get a – like you're probably a good number three, number four at a, at a company. Like go do that. You probably have a ton to offer. A lot of the larger companies, even mid-sized companies, aren't thinking the way that we do in our space. They're not thinking about you know being thought leaders. They're not thinking about innovation. The fact that you're showing that skill set and a desire to do that but you haven't taken the leap and there's something holding you back. You take those skill sets to a company. Usually what's holding you back is a steady paycheck. And I get that. Right. I mean, I, I really get that. Like just having insurance and you know, having kids, it's go be a good number three, number four. Right. I would say if you're a career student, there's a reason. Yeah. And, um, do you have that hard conversation with people that they come to you? I haven't had to, they kind of get weeded out through the process. Right. They see like – and a lot of the people that I work with, if they already don't have a successful company or they're on their way to grow, the ones that have the idea, that want to do something with the idea. Um, this is why I stopped doing a lot of the one-on-ones with the people who are like, I have an idea. What do you think? Because then what happens is I end up building your business for them and I, I just don't have the time or energy. It's not my passion, so I don't, I'm not into it as much. Right. And I don't do it for the money. I do it to help. It's one of those things where as soon as it starts to get hard, you see people kind of waver. Right. Right. And then they, they, they talk themselves out of it. I usually don't have to say anything. Right. So, you know, you're talking about that example with the ASU students and, uh, and the parking lot and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, do, do you think, cause like 
none of that was like social media stuff, right? I mean, do you nope. do you think we're overly dependent on social media, or do you think that's just kind of you and I are in that bubble where we're surrounded with a lot of people active on social media and, and like big work, big things are still being done the old school way, you know, picking up the phone, meeting somebody face to face, and making a sale, closing a deal. I think yes and no. I mean, I, when I left. I'll put it to you this way, dude, and this, we can go into this conversation because I think it's, it'd probably be helpful for some of your listeners is how do you leverage social media in your business? So when I left corporate America and then I got sued, um, I didn't have income streams. I put out uh, – I didn't have a plan B. I went all, all in with the software company, and then when, it, when everything kind of came to a crashing halt, I really – I started leveraging social media because like, you know, two years ago, it was just butterflies and rainbows. It was like, you know, pictures of my kids and like, I didn't really, I didn't really use it. Right. I mean, I used it. It was on it as a, as a casual viewer, as a time waster, right. You know, something to do in between things. And a buddy of mine, my buddy of mine, Sean challenged me to do this, um, do a series of videos. And then one of his students did, this seven day video thing. And I got caught up in that. And I did the seven day video challenge that just spiraled out of control where I just was real about who I was and what I was doing. in like these two, three minute clips about, you know, kind of the struggles and what I was doing and had started into this new venture. And if you didn't do business with me, you just didn't know who I was. So I opened it up and it was like, you know, I remember my first thousand views on something or likes on something. I was like, Whoa, like what the hell is that? And then it went from a thousand to 2000 to 3000, and in one year, I was able to hit 2 million people, and this year I'll hit 10. So, I mean, I made six figures on social media two years in a row. What I mean by that was I was able to showcase what it was I was doing without selling, connect with people in a way that where they were like, okay, that guy gets me because I've been through the same shit, and was able to continually, consistently put out value. I do six to 700 videos a year, dude, a year. And, and that, that's, that's, that's the like two, that's two a day. Like that, that's without running a business and having a family and being on the road. Like I'm consistently putting content out and that content derives to people want to know more about what I do. Cause they see a lifestyle that I've created for myself and for my family. So they want to know how to do that. Or I'll, I'll talk about some business aspect of something I'm doing in a non-sales fashion. Cause I'm not trying to sell anybody and people go, I'm in that same place right now. How do I fix that? And they call you and you, you know, you, you chop it up on the phone. Next thing you know, they're paying you for your time. Yeah. And, and you're doing this, even though you have a face made for radio. Dude, I'm telling you, I am not a handsome fella. <laughs> I, I realized, I realized a long time ago that, you know, my brother's handsome. I'm not, I'm just witty and tenacious and we'll grind you out until you like me. Right? <laughs> Either like me or you don't, but yeah, yeah, I'm not a handsome dude. I'm okay with that though. I've given up. I've kind of given it. I've given up, man. I... <laughs> That's crazy. So, all right. So you say you sell that way. I mean, so you make a video and do you, do you give a shout out to a URL? Do you let people just hunt you down and do a Google search and say, okay, who is this guy? How can I buy from him? I mean, is it like a passive aggressive sort of thing or do, or do no, you overtly no. say, okay, if you need help with this, go here and I'll help you with it. Nope. It's here are the things that I'm doing and I share the things I'm doing for the fact of sharing and showcasing because there are other people that are going through the things I'm going through or have or are going to. And like I'll give you an example. So when I was in corporate America, I was walking around at about 270. I dropped almost 100 pounds and got down to about 10%, 12% body fat in about a two-year period, year and a half period. And in this process, I was really super wound up and super wound tight. I went and had lunch with a buddy of mine, and he's like, dude, hey, he's a, he used to write the training curriculums for a big box gym here in Phoenix. I was telling to him how I felt. Physically, I felt good, but emotionally, I was a wreck. I was like just really just stressed out all the time. And he said, well, your cortisol is all messed up. I said, what? The long and the short of it, it's your hormones that produce stress. I looked at my environment. I looked at the way I was living. I was looking you know, 60 hours a week. I was on airplanes you know, three weeks out of the year, had a new baby, was on the road, well, yada, yada, yada. Life happens. And I spent 18 months, Wes, understanding how my body produced the hormones it does without having to go take – Xanax or Afran or some kind of crazy pharmaceutical that has so many side effects, I got to take medicine for my side effects. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at it, 
I, I spent 18 months. I built a blog that was getting about 20,000, 30,000 hits a month called The Healthy Primate. And I shared that story about first my weight loss, then it was um, understanding how my body, the hormones in our body works, and then I was getting blood tests every 30 days and showcasing my results, and I just I just shared the entire experience, never once trying to sell anybody, anybody anything, but I knew that I was onto something because there were so many people responding to me. And then when I launched the supplement line at the end of it, which was not my initial thought going into it. When we launched a supplement line and I took people from my personal page to the Healthy Primate page, we did six figures in 30 days. Wow. Okay, so am I selling? No, but what I'm doing is I'm, 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 if I'm, in my thought, it's like I don't do videos for the sake of doing videos. I'm trying to you know, provide something of value or something I'm thinking about or something I'm experiencing. Somebody else around the world is experiencing something very similar or has experienced something or is thinking about something that's along those experiences, and people are looking to connect. You know, I just did a post. Um, speaking to my buddy Sean, he's um, kind of he's a he's a business uh, business social media character on social media. He's a good buddy of mine who's just like he just kills it. He does videos; they get thirty, forty, fifty thousand you know in views and his engagements in the millions every time he does something. And I would I was in Salt Lake City filming a reality show with Microsoft. I went and saw him in his office, and I was talking like, dude. I'm kind of stuck at like this 5,000 thing. I can get like three to 5,000 engagements per like good post. I want to – like how do I take that from 10 to 20 to 50? Like how do I get to your numbers? And we started talking about it and it's he, – he made a joke. He said, stop selling. I'm like, I'm not selling. Like you know, I'm purposely like you know, not selling. And I thought about it for a couple – it's been uh, two weeks now. And I look at my, my feed this morning and it's like I'm uber sensitive to how everybody's showing up. Right, the people that are showing up that aren't just like the people that are actually showing up. It's like look at your feed, Wes. Like when we get off the phone, and everybody is doing some kind of selling of some sort. They're doing this, you know, this artificial engagement, and people feel that and smell that, whether they acknowledge <laughs> just, it up front. I just posted about that this morning. <laughs> Dude, yeah, like I did. I just, just pont. I just pontificated like while I was getting ready to get on this call. It's like one of those things where. Every single person and like as a viewer, there's a huge shift happening in social media right now where the lifestyle and this thing, this artificialness that everybody puts up on social media, people are kind of tired of it, right? I, th I think there's, there's going to – we're going to see a big shift here. I think there's a place for the platforms, but I think how we engage, where we engage and how things are kind of digested is changing. People see that as bullshit. What people don't see as bullshit is when you and I sit here and go, dude, how did it feel when you went outside to tell your wife, like, I just got laid off? Because guess what? I guarantee you, every one of your listeners, every one of them, if not like 90% of them have been let go from a job. Why don't we talk about that? Listen, I don't need to go into the darkest, deepest like secrets of my life, but I can tell you I've been through some shit, and if I share it, with the you know I'm going through this experience and I like I'm gonna t I'm talking to my buddy Wes on his show, and I get off this call and I pop a video on and say, man, you know what? There was something that really hit me today. I was doing this kick-ass podcast with my buddy, and we talked about being laid off, and it brought up this. Emo I remember the emotions of sitting on the couch thinking, what did I do wrong? What did I do different? It's not you, it's me, it's him. It's like this breakup scenario <laughs> and going into a depression thinking I wasn't valued. Oh, and by the way, I didn't get hired right away because like I pulled out a hundred applications and then it became this big thing. And it's like, I had all this failure on trying to get back into the market when I thought I was invaluable. Like, do you know what that's like to the ego? That's what I share. And right. then people go, I've been there. I know what that feeling is. So that that's, you, uh, just be honest. Don't lie and be yourself and people will connect to you. So when you get outside of the sell, sell, sell and you start to be – you're real about things, you're going to say something that somebody connects to. And inherently, I get 10 to 15 messages a day where people are like, what do you do? And I tell them, here's what I do. Or I send them a link. Here's what I do. Right. Right? Or tell me more about this stress thing. Right? Because I see you giving out – I give stuff away all the time to veterans and first responders. Um, I just give it away. Like I'll, I'm in all these these groups, and you'll have a guy, a veteran, will come up and be saying, "Dude, I'm really struggling right now, and um, I'm having a hard time with PTSD." And it's like, well, I can tell you now, it's been almost four years where I dedicated my life to understanding how those hormones work. Uh, send me your address, and I'll send you a box of goodies. I send them a link. I said, "Go look at this. Take it to your doctor. Make sure that there's, you know, it's all natural. Make sure you're good. And if you'd find value in this, I'll send you a box of goodies. On, I'll send you a 90 day supply on on our company." 
I don't ask for anything in return. I didn't do it as a sales pitch, right? right? It's doing the right thing is always the right thing to do, brother. And it's like when you show up and you're real and you pull the filter off of the bullshit that you continually get fed and you say enough. And um, it, it, it's one of those things where it takes practice. Yeah. Right? You just got to put the camera on you, hit record, hit send, and don't do a retake and just like let people have it. Isn't that crazy? It takes practice to be honest. <laughs> it does. Well, um, it's – it's one of it, it's because we live in a day and an age where I, like I take a picture and then I got to filter it. I got to get the right angle and I got to get the lighting right. And then I put 75 things on it. And then that one selfie is like the best version. This is what I'm talking about. The shift in social media is everybody's showing the best versions of themselves. And people are kind of tired of seeing that. It's bullshit. It's like the keeping up with the Joneses, right? It's like the Pinterest birthday party that all the kids have. It's like when I was growing up, dude, we did Chuck E. Cheese and we're eating shit off the floor and had tokens and played skee ball. Like I didn't have handmade crafts that came in a custom jar with my name engraved on them for every kid that came to the party. It's like this weird lifestyle that that, that I think is coming to uh, the narcissistic side as to how we show up is kind of run its course. And I think more and more people are getting tired of it. Yep. So the, the, the time for us to shine as individuals and to showcase who we really are, I think starts to separate. And that's really a scary, scary thing to do. People don't want to talk about mistakes. People yep. just want to talk about how great they are. Right. Right? Yeah. I what do, you, do, do you feel – let me ask you this. Do, are you feeling a shift and is what I'm saying, does that resonate? Hey, this is my show. I ask the questions. Okay. We're going to go ahead and we're gonna edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, you know, I, I do that all the time when I, I, I've been blessed enough to be on shows, man, and I, I do that. I, just, I don't know. It's a conversation. Some buddies uh, having a beer. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. I've, I've always had this like bittersweet relationship with social media. Uh, and I would, dude, I would literally go days and not make a video because I was like, well, I got to get dressed. Well, to get dressed means I got to shower. And then to get dressed means I got to shave. Well, I hate showering and I hate shaving. You know, I, 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 I iron my shirt. Got to iron my shirt. I got, yeah. I, 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 I shower perfect. once a week whether I need it or not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is how I spend my day. I mean, I'm yeah. in, in my workout gear. I'll go to the gym. I'll come back. So I was like, screw it. Just turn the phone on, hit record, you know, and let's get this thing done. And uh, because I hate all the phony baloney stuff, you know, and it's like you're going to hear my dog bark. You probably hear my kids. I work from home. I got seven kids. You know, one's away at college. The other six are here. You know, you're going to hear doors closing, doorbells ringing, dogs barking. You know, half the time somebody walks in behind me like, hey, honey, how you doing? You might want to put some clothes on, (laughs) you know, say hi to the world. Uh, So... (laughs) I just roll with it, you know, and, and it's just so liberating to just not give a crap. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, do, you, do you think that it's getting saturated with everybody kind of showing up with a false sense of who they really are? Are oh, you yeah. seeing that? Well, yeah, because the crazy thing is I'm, I've been the behind-the-scenes guy for hundreds of people, uh, of entrepreneurs, and dozens and dozens that people know, uh, big names that people know uh, with my work with Infusionsoft. Yep. And it's not that it was ever a secret, but I mean, if you're a client, I don't just, you know, unless I ask you for a testimonial, I don't put it out there, right? But but doing so much work with Infusionsoft, and I see I see who's real, who isn't. I see people that have big personas, but behind the scenes, they're a total freaking mess. Uh, and and I just know it's 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 not as glamorous and as beautiful and as put together with a nice, neat little bow that most people, you know, put it out to be. And, uh, but then that, that puts a pressure on the up and comers to think, well, I'm not good enough because look at such and such. And I'm like, they're a total wreck. Yeah. You know, yeah. you are good enough. Keep rolling. You know, you gotta keep pushing ahead. And, uh, so yeah, I think it's coming down. I, it's just today. I, I saw some dude that I'm like, we're Facebook friends. I don't really know him. And it was just some BS question he asked today just for edge rank, right? Just to get engagement. Yep. So I was like, I just unfollowed the guy and I was like, Hey everybody, look, Facebook has this algorithm and people try to manipulate it. You know, don't be a sheep, you yep. know, don't yep. be a sure. sheep and engage and don't help that person bubble up to attract more sheep. You yep. know, it's like, Oh, that, that, that's a new thing in the last six months where um, I remember legitimately, I would, I would ask a question and, cause I would get into these, like I would get into these debates and I would ask a great question would be, how many of you have had a business idea 
and didn't move forward with it for one reason or another. And why? Like I legitimately want to know like why. Right. For me, it's market research. I don't know, want to just assume I know what the marketplace is doing. If I were to ask that question now, I would fall right in line with all these other yahoos. It's like when I would ask questions like that, I would get responses, and immediately I would engage in that discussion on that thread with each of those people. Yeah. These other people don't do that. They ask the question just to line them up and then take those names down and then retarget them for some kind of program. And it's like, man, it's it's um, that's where authenticity differs, man. And people sniff it a mile away. Like you go through your feed and you immediately know if somebody's being real or not. Yeah. yeah like I mean, me or not, you're always going to know where you sit with me. Like there's no bullshit. Like you know, yeah. either it's, it's it's either black or white. There's no gray. Yeah, I mean, this guy. The question might as well have been like. You know, would you rather lick the inside of someone's shoe or their armpit? You know, like both. Yeah, it's like good grief, That's like that cool. Saturday Night Live girl was it? smelling her armpits. Remember? I'm done. I do that. Like, <laughs> I'm done. You know, I'm done, 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 done with dummies, done with idiots. Just, oh my gosh. Oh well. All right, man. Well, we've pontificated. All right, final question. And I'll let yes, you sir. get on with your life. What uh, what would you have our listeners do? You know, I always say, picture them driving, they're jogging, they're riding a bike, they can't really take notes necessarily, but what should they do as a result of listening to this? What should what action should they take the first moment they can uh, to get after it, to grow, to launch a business, to stop launching a business because they're no good at it? I mean, what, what should they do after listening to you? Stop lying to yourself. Just do whatever you think you're supposed to be doing. You got to just get up and do it. And then I, I end almost all my videos with the same thing, and I, I would share this here. Be good to yourself. Forgive yourself for your past and all the things you've done. That's what makes you human. Be good to other people. And call your mom. That's it. All right. Call your mother. If your mother's not alive, call your dad. Call somebody close to your family. Always call your mother. It's one of those things where my, my mom's not here now. It's one of those things where every time there was something cool, I'd call her. And I've got so many things that, you know what I mean? Like, call your mom. You can right. never call your parents enough. Yep. Amen. Yeah. That's I'm it, a, dude. I'm going to make sure my son gets this so um, he knows to call his mom. Cause Tag he, him in it. <laughs> he, he's in Buenos Aires right now. So he's, every semester he's in a new country. So uh, What's he doing? Uh, he's just studying, but it's a new, brand new college. He'll be in the first graduating class. It's called Minerva. That's awesome. Awesome. Every semester there, somewhere new, learning. Love it. Good Love stuff, it. my brother. All Thank right. Thanks so for having me on the show, dude. And, and to your listeners, I, you know, I really. I always appreciate the opportunity and the chance to come on and speak to a new audience. So thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been great having you. So Colby K., we're going to send them to simplemoneymethods.com. Is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Go there or go to facebook.com forward slash I'm Colby K. So the letter I, the letter M for I'm Colby with a K, K K-O-L-B-Y, last name K-A-Y. There you go. And we'll link to it as well in the show notes. All right, man. Colby K. Hit the gym, my brother. Great. I'm going. I'm going. I'll talk to you soon, brother. Bye. All right. Later. How cool was that interview, huh? Colby's a good dude. Follow him. You know, I, I link to everything. Uh, that he mentioned, you know, look him up, his, uh, his healthy primate, uh, find him online, see what he's up to, you know, surround yourself with good people. Uh, but you know what? You got to pick and choose as well. Uh, if you decide to follow him, you need to unfollow someone else. Uh, you can't have too many things coming into your brain. I, I literally uh, just this morning unsubscribed from, I think, four different things. I mean, people that I was interested in, people that are good at what they do, but I just had too much coming in my inbox. You know, if you see that you're constantly putting off or deleting or just, um, you know, hiding away or, or just filing away different emails, just unsubscribe. You know, I, I made a post the other day. It's like, to, are people, is it FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Uh, or do we have the fear of going deep? F-O-G-D. Uh, this doesn't have quite the ring as FOMO, but hey, it's reality. And I think it's I think we're afraid of going deep. You know, we let ourselves get distracted with incoming emails, social media posts, chiming in on, you know, what big company screwed up. Was it Pepsi with their stupid ad or United dragging a guy off? I mean, 
Okay, great. Maybe you can learn something about PR and customer service and whatnot, but how does that help you personally? How does it help your business to be all caught up in a Pepsi commercial or United issue? You know, even stuff going on in Syria and Afghanistan or whatever. Do you really know? Are you a world policy expert? Are you an expert at Middle East negotiations? I mean, you need to be aware of things, right? You need to be informed uh, so you can vote intelligently. But, um, I mean, how many of these issues do we really need to worry ourselves with? And so many people get so amped up over things, and I think it's because we're afraid of going deep. You know, as long as you can say that you're upset and distraught and worried about, you know, war in Syria or war in Afghanistan, that's your excuse for not going deep into your own business. You really want to make a difference in Syria or Afghanistan or Mogadishu or wherever? Go make a million dollars. Go make $10 million. Go make $100 million. And you know what? Then you can afford to send aid. You can go on humanitarian missions. You can have your own private jet and fill that thing up with water and vitamins and antibiotics and bandages uh, and go help truly impoverished people. But just sitting around, you know, being a social justice warrior on Facebook, you're not doing anything. So unsubscribe from a few. All right, for every one you subscribe to, unsubscribe from two. And uh, find people you really resonate with. Surround yourself with great people and go deep. Go deep, deep, deep. Master whatever it is you were put on this earth to do. Uh, shout it from the rooftops. Tell the world how great you are. And you'll make a difference in the world. Okay? So I hope this interview with Colby helped you. If you're looking for a group to help push you and help you go deep, Join me, makeeverysale.com. If you don't like it, tell me. I'll give you your money back. All right? But uh, it's time to go deep. It's time to go big. So thanks for listening. Please share this. Leave a five-star review. And as always, remember to sell different.